Hello, hello, this is Week by Week. I'm Celeste and I'm 31 weeks pregnant. I'm gonna be honest, I'm feeling really sad today. Dave and I get into more details about it in the update, but I'm definitely just feeling low. And I think you can hear that throughout the update. So just for the sake of honesty, I wanted to start there and share that. And then later on in the episode, we have the wonderful Molly Erdman. Let's do this. We're going to talk about week 31. Can you believe it? No. (laughs) Feels like we're still in week 27. It does. And it's amazing to me that he is such a little guy now. I mean, we're not ready for him to come into the world quite yet. Stay in there, buddy. (laughs) Please. But he's really a little guy. Yeah. It's kind of amazing. It is. It's really incredible when he's starting to respond when I talk to him. He's starting to kick right where I talk to him, which is incredible. That's been something really special that's really increased in the last couple weeks is he really, really responds to you talking to my belly and he'll kick right where your lips are or it's just, it's really an incredible thing to see this little kind of conversation emerging already. Leave me alone, dude. No. I'm sleeping. Please stop waking me up. (laughs) I like my dad. (laughs) Lots of Braxton Hicks still. I tend to get them at a, you know, around evening time. And I mentioned it to my doctor and she said it could be also a sign of some dehydration. And I have found just for whatever reason with my rhythm, I'm not that thirsty until like four or so. So it could be that I'm needing some more water by the time we get to night. So trying to drink a lot of water. Sleep has been awful. And just like my hips hurt, my knees hurt. I switch from side to side. It's just been uncomfortable. And I think it's probably been affecting both of us. You can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel you wake up and sometimes it wakes me up. Yeah, just practice. It's also, yeah, yeah. (laughs) So this week we had our doctor's appointment. It was our next one since two weeks ago. So we're in this two-week interval timeline right now for our appointments, which is quickly going to pick up to once a week. And it was really tough. It was a really hard appointment. And it's really affected me for the rest of the day. I just feel really low and yeah. So let's get into it. Yeah, We're still in a situation where Dave isn't allowed to come with me into the doctor. So I'm going alone, but it is nice because I can FaceTime him through the whole experience. So I'll FaceTime him when I do the ultrasound and then I'll FaceTime him again usually right before the doctor comes in and then he'll be on the phone through when I'm done talking to the doctor. And then sometimes when I don't know where you parked, I'll FaceTime you again. <laughs> sometimes we get an extra. Sometimes we get a an bonus. extra, a little bonus in there. The, 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 the extra milkshake in the silver container. Which is an expression Dave is very fond of. <laughs> <laughs> so I had an ultrasound and Two weeks ago when I had the appointment, he was measuring small. So they told me to up the calories and focus on getting more protein and fat in my diet. And we have been, to me at least it feels this way, like competitive eating level eating. (laughs) It's been crazy. I'm just like eating double for every meal. We were hoping to see a positive change or at least hoping that he would stay the percentile that he was. So obviously that means incrementally increasing his weight, but not dipping below the small percentile that he's already in. And unfortunately, he has dipped lower. And so he's in an even smaller 
percentile, I guess, for what his weight should be given his gestational age. That means we have to go to a high-risk clinic this week. So we're going to go, the appointment was on Tuesday. And so we'll have an update again on Friday in week 32 about what the appointment for at the clinic looked like. But it's just really scary. It's really hard. And in talking to my doctor, she thought maybe it might be a placenta issue. And so that's what we're going to be looking at, that Perhaps my placenta has kind of stopped or is stopping giving him the nutrients that he needs. So it's really hard. There's nothing I can do to change it or to control it. I mean, I can keep eating, which is good, and try to get as much nutrients to him as I can. And I'm really taking it easy and trying not to burn any extra calories. And hopefully I'll have a stronger directive after Friday's appointment. But if it is a placenta thing, then we just monitor it basically is seems to be what my understanding is from talking to the doctor. So that means we'll keep tracking his growth. And as soon as it seems like the placenta is just not doing it anymore, he will have to come. So ideally we'll make it five more weeks with the placenta working and him being safe inside of me. That would technically get him to full term because once you get to 37 weeks, I think that's the benchmark for when you can call it full term. And if not, then we will have a baby sooner than we expected. We talked a little bit with the doctor about the potential of him ending up in the NICU for a couple days or, you know, just depending on when he comes, what some expectations might be for that. And it just sounds like we're just going to be in a phase coming up till whenever he comes where we're just going to be closely monitoring him and taking it from there. Do you have anything you want to add? Yeah. Um, it's been really hard and it's, it's a lot of cross currents of information because, you know, we first go in and they put him on the ultrasound and his heartbeat is so strong and the blood flow from the umbilical cord to him is really strong. Fluid looks good. The fluid looks good. Cervix is good. It Cervix doesn't look looks like really good. Labor. And he's cute as a button. Yes, we did also get to do a 3D thing. Got a 3D see. thing. He's a cute one. And he flipped down. So he's right. doing what he should be doing. His he's- head is down. So it's really hard because a lot of the biggest markers that we've been, you know, looking for and told to look for are all really positive. So then to have this other element, it's hard, you know. Hi, baby. <laughs> he just gave a little he kick. He just gave a little kick. And he, his movement has been really solid. Yeah, he's been moving all around and responding to my voice. And yeah. so it's hard because a lot of the things that feel right and feel good, it seems like he's doing those things. So, So it's really been testing, I think, both of us on – our expectations and also just how we're perceiving him. Yeah. And I think that's like, I don't know, feels like it feels like it's an early education in just like parenting and, you know, what to expect and everything. But I don't know where this comes from, but I am not as worried Mm -hmm. because I just, I don't know what it is, but I, I mean, I'm concerned for him and for you, but I'm not worried about the end result. So I think something that's been hard for me with this the last couple weeks and with this news, especially because his percentile decreased, is I feel a lot of responsibility to really be aware of, are his kicks good? Has he been moving enough? Is he lethargic? Is there any sign that I, I I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't want to miss a single sign. And it feels extra scary right now because I think that's, it's always a concern. I've talked to so many friends who have gone in Because they felt decreased movement and it just turns out, you know, the baby was in a different position or a little sleepy. So I know that I think just when you get to this point, you're very aware of the kicks and very aware of that sensation. 
having his health feel a little bit more precarious, I think, is making me feel really nervous that I'm going to miss something. And I get anxious if I don't feel him for a little bit, even though I know, you know, he could be sleeping or, yeah, that's been tough from this kind of new phase of things. I was talking to my therapist about it and something she said, because I was remarking that I was feeling a little self-conscious about my bump size because I, you know, feel like I don't want him to be small. I want him to be big and I want him to be safe and thinking about this time, how I will remember it. And, you know, Dave and I are going to try to do a distance photo shoot with our wedding photographer to kind of capture some of these, this moment. And I was saying to her that I feel a little sad about it now and less excited because I am worried that you know, my bump is too small and he's not doing as well as I'd like. And, and she was like, he is going to love having, you know, something to look at and say like, that's where I was. And this is part of his journey. And remembering that like, all of this is part of his story. It was, it just really touched me because it was such a nice reminder that as hard as this is, this is just going to be part of how he came into the world. And you know, we all get to decide how we tell this story. The same thing goes through the pandemic where I think it's like, there are definitely some things that have been really tough, but there have been some things that have also been really beautiful. And Dave and I, and this little guy will, you know, together shape how we tell this story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts? You've been very supportive. I've really been down. I definitely feel like I've been crying a lot and, and I'm trying also not to stress my body. So that's tough too. You know, it's just, it's so much, all of it is just so much. Yeah. You're holding so much and you're doing so much. And I just, I wish I could just take some of it for a while. Mm. Do you want to do a quick update about where he is? Sure. So we are week 31. He is measuring around 16.2 inches, could be around 3.3 ounces. Pounds. Oops. (laughs) 3.3 pounds, just to be clear. Could be around 3.3 pounds. This is why I have you around. Why don't you read the next stats? Baby's brain is forming wrinkles so that it can store more brain cells. This is the kind of stuff that I'm just like, how does it know to do that? It's amazing. Like the inner coding of it is insane and cool. The website says your baby's brain is working overtime these days, developing faster than ever. Connections between individual nerve cells, and he's got to make billions of them, are being made at a super fast rate. He's now processing information, tracking light, and perceiving signals from all five senses. Wow. It's amazing. He may not be able to smell anything right now, but that's only because he's still submerged in amniotic fluid, and he needs to be breathing air to get a whiff of anything. Lucky for you and your baby, yours will be one of the very first scents he breathes in. Mm. A scent that will quickly become his very favorite. That's really sweet. Yeah. That's going to make me cry. Everything's going to make me cry right now. Well, this is the cry time. This is the cry time. Oh, I'm just sad. This is tough. It is tough. It's okay. It's okay for you to be sad. Yeah. The reason you're sad is beautiful is because you're a mama and you're so concerned about him and so focused on him. I just want him to be okay. I know. I know, sweet one. It's so hard. I know, baby. <sighs> It is. He's okay. He's going to be okay. He's a strong little guy. He is. He's tough. He's been through a lot. Yes, he has. As this podcast is documented, he's been through a lot and so have you. Sweet boy. Yeah. Let's get back on track. We got Braxton Hicks could be picking up, which they definitely are. Mm Mm-hmm. Since they are not in a specific pattern, they're not necessarily an, uh, 
indicator of labor. Thank you. That's exactly what I was trying to say. I'm starting to read your mind a little bit more. Oh, you have to these days. We are narrowing down in our search about pediatrician. Mm -hmm. Because we'll have to have that uh, set soon for his visit. Mm -hmm. And just a couple more things from the website just to reflect on. Oh, it says a baby sleeping more, Mm -hmm. fighting in longer stretches of sleep. We're noticing that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And I also notice it's really sweet because like if I'm lying down, sometimes he moves a lot when I lie down. But if it seems like he's fallen asleep while I'm lying down and then I get up or switch sides, he'll wake up and move around and flutter around. And it's really sweet. It's my favorite thing is feeling him. He's having a lot of hiccups. Lots of hiccups. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Which is a normal thing. That's a thing that is helping him learn how to breathe. Yes. But at at least once a day, I would say we definitely have a a case of hiccups. (laughs) And it it usually lasts for about five minutes. But I'm always like, I'm sorry. I wish there was something I could do. Having some shortness of breath. Definitely. I can feel it when we walk. Um, And even just sitting here and kind of focusing on this. Definitely, I'm just getting crunched. There's, mm-hmm. you know, he's getting bigger, which is great. And it's moving my organs around. Oh, here's the last thing that we're going to say. Peeing all the time. We've been watching West Wing. Re-wa- I guess Dave is re-watching it, and I'm watching it for the first time. And I try to wait to the end of a scene, and then I'm like, okay, pause. I have to pee. And I have to do that, like, what, five times an episode? Three All to five time. times an episode. It yes. is so much. It's a lot of pee. It's a lot of pee. We've had lots of pee talk. Yes. <laughs> Always very excited to get an update on the most recent pee. <laughs> and pregnancy brain. Boy, oh boy, is that a thing? Clumsiness. I don't know. Yeah, sure. We'll sure, say I don't know. Maybe. I don't, we'll say I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah. Oh, and then the last thing I'll say is the nursery is really coming along. Yeah. And that's really sweet. I, it's, lots of lots of things coming into the room and coming into shape. and It feels really special in yeah. there. And now we have the crib up and the mattress is on its way and it just feels really special. Whenever he comes, we'll have a place ready for him. Yes. We love you, baby boy. Everyone, just popping in to say if you're enjoying this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, and follow us on Instagram at Week by Week Podcast. Our guest today is Molly Erdman. Molly is an actor, writer, and mother. She's so warm and had such great insight. Molly also wrote an article for Huffington Post about her experience with pregnancy hair loss. It's a really great piece. We talk about it for a bit during the interview, but I also posted it in the show notes so you can read it in its entirety. So. Let's do this. How many kids do you have? Let me, I guess, let me get the basics. (laughs) Um, So I have a six-year-old daughter. I also have a 17-year-old stepdaughter, but she doesn't live with us. So we're we're just dealing with the (laughs) six-year-old right now. That's like, I can only imagine that's a ton because at six, that's school age. And how have you guys been navigating that? We're really fortunate in a lot of ways I think like the toughest age is like between two and four because Mm. they are like all over the place. They can't be unsupervised, but they also won't play on their own. I have friends with that age kid. I'm like, God bless. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. But with her, it's fortunate because she, so she's going into first grade. She does pretty well, like doing stuff on her own and is pretty independent in that way. And she also is just in a phase where she loves me and Joe, her dad. And so she misses her friends. But anytime I tell her news, like, well, you're not going to be going back to school in the fall. She's like sad for a second. And then she's like, well, I get to spend more time with my family. Oh, <laughs> you know, kind of like the perfect phase for it right is. Now. It's really sweet. So we'll see how things go. Like certainly I, you know, it's heartbreaking that she can't see her friends and stuff like that. But I think given the circumstances, she's been so patient and understanding and everything. And it, I feel so lucky. I'm so curious on how you navigate what you tell them because it's like, it's a lot of information and heavy information to try to consume. So like, how do you make it age appropriate and still keep it safe for a little one? 
Yeah, it's been really hard. And she knew from school, like in the spring when they were going to close the school for what was two weeks at the time, (laughs) she understood why. Like they explained what this was and they didn't want to get people to get sick. They didn't explain, fortunately, the gravity of it and everything like that. So it's striking a balance. And I think it's so fortunate that although I think we're going to see stuff happen when places where schools are opening, it's fortunate that kids aren't generally like really affected by it. So she, you know, we keep telling her that so that she's not afraid for herself, Okay. but she does know that people have died and things like that. But she's very, I think it's actually helped because she understands the importance of it and why it's been going on for so long. So it's tough. You know, she notices a lot and we'll have the news on and not even realize it and she'll see something. So, you know, we're trying to not lie about anything, but sort of just give the details that are necessary. All of parenthood is like, give the information that is necessary. And yeah. More. And it's the first thing that has come up as a parent that my daughter has experienced that I haven't also experienced. Other things like, you know, first day of school that could be scary or getting in a fight with a friend that can be scary. It's like all of those things, my husband and I can draw on our experience and be able to empathize and things like this. And this is just like, I don't know, it's tough. (laughs) We're all in this together right now. Everyone has a childhood pandemic to live through, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about what your journey toward motherhood was like. And like, did you always know you wanted to be a mom or just, I guess, what that whole process was for you? Yeah. Like a lot of kids, I sort of grew up just assuming that I would be a mom at some point. But then when I got older, so I had been married once before and I got married when I was like 26 or something. He and I had never discussed kids or anything. And then I think sort of just, I think we just, there was just an agreement of like, eh, I don't know, we're young, mm-hmm. we got time. And I can't tell if it was that I was like, I don't think I want kids or if it was just, I am not even going to worry about that until I'm like 35 or something mm-hmm. like that, I think was, was my thought. Eventually that marriage deteriorated. And one thing that became more evident is that while I don't think my ex was necessarily opposed to having kids, he did not seem to like children. (laughs) And I know that there are people like that who like don't like kids in the abstract, but love Mm -hmm. their own and enjoy being a parent. But I think it's hard to think about being a parent when your partner does not seem to enjoy that aspect. So in my early thirties, that marriage ended And I started dating my now husband who already has a kid who at the time was about the age of our daughter now. And there was part of me that's like, well, maybe this will feel like, maybe this will sort of fulfill any, you know, parenting instinct or, or whatever that I might be feeling. And I think it actually made me want to have a child of my own because I saw how Joe, my husband was with his daughter. I saw that he was a good father. I saw that relationship. I saw that he loved kids, Um, Mm -hmm. not just his daughter, but, you know, her friends, friends, kids, like the way he interacted with them was like, oh, this is what it looks like when someone likes kids. (laughs) (laughs) So I think there was a part of me that was thinking about it a lot. And then it really was when I hit like 35 and, and it was, I think a huge part of it was that my friends started having kids, my close Mm -hmm. friends. I had friends who like from college and high school who lived in other parts of the country and were in very different lines of work where, you know, for actors, a lot of times, you know, you just never feel like it's the right time to do it. So when those friends were having kids, you know, in their late twenties or early thirties, I was like, well, that's okay. They're, they're in a different lane from me. Mm -hmm. But when my close friends here who were also like actors and writers and things like that started having kids, I was like, oh, so we're doing this, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Um, It was almost like it hadn't really occurred to me that it was time to start thinking about this. And so, yeah, when I, I think when I turned 35, I was like, okay, well, we need to start putting this plan in motion if it's something that we want to do. And it, it was still a few years. And actually my husband and I, we weren't sure if we wanted to get married because we'd both been married before. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, we were sort of trying to figure out the, the having a baby issue. And so we saw a couples counselor for like three sessions specifically to kind of like sort that out. So not mm-hmm. like a long-term thing, but just like, let's talk about this. And it was 
incredibly helpful because it gave us the opportunity to kind of voice our concerns, excitement, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. In, in kind a of really a, safe place. Yeah. In a, in a safe place, in a neutral place with someone who would kind of like draw things out of us a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, we eventually between that, and then we still waited a few months and then we finally decided that like, yes, we would try to have a kid and that yes, we would get married. The marriage part you know, almost just sort of a logistics issue as much as anything else. So, you know, that was it. And part of what we had done in our therapy sessions is, you know, there was sort of a list of questions that's like, are you on the same page about parenthood? Mm -hmm. And not that those answers are necessarily a disqualifier or whatever, but they were sort of jumping off points of discussion. And Mm -hmm. a lot of it was like talking about, you know, at at the time I was 37. And so we were talking about like, well, what kind of intervention, if, if we don't get pregnant within a certain amount of time, mm-hmm. what, what would be, we be willing to do? What would we not, we not be willing to do? You know, things like that. So mm-hmm. I feel like we really did a good job of kind of feeling everything out, you know, discussing our concerns and hopes and dreams and whatever. And, and then we just decided, all right, let's go for it. And so that was, let's see, we got married December 30th of 2012. Mm-hmm. And it turned out I was already pregnant then, and I didn't know it. So yeah, so we we put it all in motion all at, all at once. It ended up I got pregnant very quickly, which was incredibly fortunate. Mm-hmm. And so then here we are. That's amazing. With the questions that you answered, yeah. were there any surprises or anything that came up for you guys where you're like, oh, we're more opposite than I thought, or this is more of a like thing to discuss or something like that? You know, I don't think that there was. I think that what is interesting is that we were coming at it, like in hindsight, I kind of see it a little bit differently Mm. because we were approaching those questions as Joe, who already had a daughter. Mm -hmm. So is actively a parent and has Mm -hmm. firsthand experience being a parent versus me, where my answers were sort of all, you know, theoretical. Mm -hmm. Like, here's how I assume I would handle this situation. Because there were questions about like, disciplining kids and, you know, like the roles of the parents and Mm -hmm. and things like that. And what I know now to be true, and to be honest, I can't remember every exact question, Mm -hmm. but like some of the things about sort of parenting style, I was just taking a guess at because I Mm -hmm. didn't know what my parenting style, but I was like, well, knowing what I know about myself, here's what I'm going to guess. And it wasn't always true because I just don't think you can know what kind of parent you're going to be until you're doing it. I think also the type of kid you have dictates the parenting style. And like my husband's older daughter is very different from our daughter. They have very different personalities. And so it's almost like, even though he had been a parent before, he was sort of starting over with Mm. a new kid, a new personality, someone new to be parenting with. So I, I think it was all very helpful to have those conversations, but I think in hindsight, you have to kind of realize the restrictions of that, that you're, you're taking your best guess at some things and, and you don't know until you're in it, how you're really going to, going to handle it. So, you yeah. know, to me, people who choose to become parents are optimists, especially right now, <laughs> the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> especially right now is the phrase that everyone says all the time. But, but seriously, because it, it says like, you know, things are going to get better or mm-hmm. things aren't going to get worse. <laughs> right. And so I think that taking that leap can be, you know, really scary. And that's why you try to figure out all the stuff you can ahead of time. But at a point you just have to release it and be like, I don't know. Sometimes you have to remember that of like, you have to tailor things to who they are yeah. and, and experiment. And, and we're, we're still doing that six years in of sort of trying to figure out, you know, what works in what circumstances. In thinking about sort of what we talked about at the top, how do you navigate like sitting down and having tricky conversations with her? Not just like what information she can handle, but like, do you have an approach of saying like, this is how we talk about it? Or does it kind of like subject by subject? Yeah, I think it kind of varies. I remember being like this as a kid, Mm -hmm. like where, you know, your parents, it's almost harder on the parents to be like, okay. Like when, when I had to tell her that she wasn't going back to school Mm -hmm. at the end of kindergarten, like she loved her teacher so much. And, you know, it was, they had to leave without knowing that they weren't coming back. So I remember having to tell her that, and I was so worked up about it. I was Mm -hmm. like, she's going to be so upset and how am I going to comfort her and whatever. 
And I, I sat her down and I try to like remove distractions and, you know, mm-hmm. like put the iPad away, whatever. I'm already making it sound like my kid is on the iPad all the time. <laughs> no, no, no. Almost, <laughs> almost all the time. She has to eat <laughs> occasionally. So sure. Yeah. Um, quick breaks. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I just say like, you know, I want to talk to you about something and I really try very hard to be matter of fact. And like I was saying before, tell her what she needs to know. Mm-hmm. And if she asks questions, be ready for those questions but to not, you know, give more information than she's asking for, both Mm -hmm. not overwhelm her, but also like, she just may not need to know more. We had to actually during quarantine, we had to let her know about someone who had died Mm. and, and really the closest person she's known who has died. And it was really interesting because, you know, Joe and I both sat down with her and we told her and she like immediately made the sort of cry face, the like pre-cry face. Mm -hmm. And then she kind of pulled it together for a second. And it was a very brief thing. You know, we asked if she had any questions and she asked how old he was and he was not very old because he Mm -hmm. had cancer. And yeah, so it was, it was a lot to have to explain. Yeah. But we were like, let's just give her the, the, in, the basic information. And then over the course of the next you know, few days, she would ask questions about it. And you know, I just don't want to lie mm-hmm. <laughs> about stuff. Mm-hmm. I may not tell the whole truth, but my goal is to be like straightforward, to be candid, but to also you know, keep it simple. Mm-hmm. But it's case to case, like everything, every one of those conversations is something different. And I think it's so much about you know, you sort of plan out what you want to say, but at a point you can't, there's no script and you just have to like follow their lead and see what they need from you. And I think to also at times be able to say like, I don't know, I don't have the answer to this. And that is so hard because you want to have every answer for them and you can't. It's important to me to, to make sure she feels comfortable being able to ask questions Mm -hmm. about anything. And, you know, that with her emotions and everything that she knows that whatever she's feeling is totally okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's pretty heartbreaking because just in the past year, she has started being embarrassed to cry in front of people. Mm. And so she uh, sometimes when she's feeling that, and a lot of times it's like if we have to snap at her about something or she does something wrong or, you know, whatever, she gets embarrassed. And so she goes and sits in her closet. I know. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) And yeah, it's a heartbreaker, but it's also like, okay, well, she's figured out sort of a coping technique. And and we tell her, we're like, that's totally okay to do. Let us know when you're ready to talk and, and just to try to validate, you know, those feelings and things like that in practical ways. Like we aren't always able to do that, but we, we try to, to do that the best we can as much as we can. I've thought so much of like how to kind of normalize that feelings are okay. And then you can figure, you know, I, I think before becoming a parent, that concept was not even on my radar. Like I didn't even think about stuff like that. And then I remember again with my kids, my friends whose kids were a couple years older, mm-hmm. Once they were, you know, hitting two and three and having like these big tantrums and everything Mm -hmm. that, you know, they would talk about like giving them the space to have those tantrums. And I was like, oh, that never occurred to me. I assume you're just trying to, you know, stop that (laughs) as as fast (laughs) as you can. And so that was really eye-opening to me. And we still do with Valerie when she gets really upset is having some kind of outburst or whatever is we're like, this is totally fine. Just go to your room Mm -hmm. and be angry and cry and do whatever you need to. Mm -hmm. And when you're done, let us know Mm -hmm. and we could talk about it. And it is hard to do that because especially for me personally, I am the type of person who wants to manage everyone's emotions Mm -hmm. and doesn't want anyone to be upset ever. I don't want anyone to feel bad. I don't want anyone to feel disappointment. And so I think one of the biggest challenges for me as a mom has been allowing my daughter to feel disappointment Mm. and to not try to make it better and to not try to say like, oh, this thing broke. Well, that's okay. I'll immediately get you a new one or, you know, whatever. And just be like, yeah, that is really sad when something we love breaks. And to just like sit with that is it's so uncomfortable for me. So tough. <laughs> it's so tough. Disappointment yeah. of a loved one or somebody who you really care about in particular is, yeah. I think, one of the toughest places to just sit in because you just want to fix it. Have you found 
anything for yourself to kind of be able to soothe during those experiences or do you just kind of get used to it? You know, I think of it as the same feeling of like taking medicine that tastes gross or, Mm. you know, going to the gym when you don't want to. Mm -hmm. I think of it as it's an exercise and what I'm doing as hard as it is to do, as much as it might break my heart is I am building her emotional muscles. I am giving her the emotional medicine that she needs to be able to cope with these things as she goes through life. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of the solace that I find of like, this sucks, but it's a good thing that I'm doing. Just just like so much of like disciplining and and saying no and things like that is like, you, you have to be able to see the big picture to be able to get through those things, I think. Absolutely. There's so much about, you know, talking to kids about these emotions. Like we've had some great books and things Mm -hmm. that say exactly that about like being aware that this feeling is not forever. Like you're in it, feel it right now, but it will go away. And they have to learn that. And they have to learn that they have the power to to move past that emotion that I don't have to give, you know, them chocolate milk or whatever is, or a balloon. They can navigate it. Uh, Yeah, their own resiliency, which will be such a strength later on. Yes, absolutely. I would love to talk a little bit about the article you sent. And if you don't mind just telling the story of that, um, but if if you don't mind going into the journey of your pregnancy, that would be fantastic. My pregnancy started, it was gangbusters. It was great. Like I got pregnant like the second month that, that we were trying you know, everything was going really well. Initially, I didn't have morning sickness. I felt great, felt totally fantastic. And then like past 20 weeks, and I was starting to get like just some weird symptoms, like the bottoms of my feet itched really badly. And then my scalp started to itch really badly to the point where like, I remember I was still teaching improv at the time. And I just remember a couple of times that I would just accidentally kind of graze my hair, like putting my hair behind my ears or something. And so any light touch would just trigger my entire scalp, just feeling like just uncontrollably itchy. It was just, and the more I scratched it, the worse it was. And it was just awful. And so I started to notice on like when I would comb my hair, Mm -hmm. like a little more hair than usual would come out. Mm -hmm. So I had an appointment to get my hair. I think I was getting cut and colored because you can still get your hair colored when you're pregnant. Um, <laughs> and I emailed the the woman who does my hair, who's a friend of mine. And I was like, Hey, I'm having a lot of like itchy scalp and stuff. I, I don't think I can do the color. And she's like, Oh, I'll just give you a scalp treatment instead. And I was like, oh, great. So she did. And as she was, you know, going through my hair, she noticed on the back of my head, like a, the size of a quarter, a bald patch. And she was like, this just looks like some alopecia this probably is tied into, you know, your, your head itching and stuff. And I remember she literally said the words, like, it's not like you're going to lose all your hair. Um, but I I think I was actually around maybe 30 weeks or something. Mm -hmm. So my hair just kept falling out. So like I would, I would brush it and it was just like, I mean, I have a lot of hair fortunately, but it also really dragged out this process that just like, I, I would take a brush and just all the hair I just brushed would be attached to it. Wow. It was crazy. At first, it was just like, well, you know, my hair is thinner, but it's, I can still, you know, exist as a normal person. Mm -hmm. And then it just kept going. So, like, my part was like an inch wide. Um, My hairline was receding and it was just patches of hair gone. So, I didn't have a great obstetrician. I thought he was great at first. But as soon as my hair started falling out, it was like he did not care. This guy was like 80. He knew his stuff. And in hindsight, I think he was confronted with something that he did not have an answer for. Mm. And so he kind of shut down with me. And in hindsight, I should have found a different doctor. And I didn't. And I, at some point, he was out of town. And so I saw his associate. And I was mm-hmm. like, well, maybe I'll like her more. Mm-hmm. She was equally unconcerned. About so or, interesting. Or she just had no answers. Like there, there seemed to be just this air of like, well, pregnancy is weird. Sometimes weird things happen. You know, sometimes people lose fingers or toes. Like just it happens. I was like, what? You're like, but um, I'm living with this. This yes, is happening yeah. to me. I didn't know if it's because my doctor was bald that he was like, welcome <laughs> to the club. <laughs> um, you know, I've been talking to my mom about what was going on. 
And she one day was like, you need to get your thyroid checked. She's like, this could be connected to your thyroid. And I was like, well, I already did because I was 38 uh, Mm -hmm. when I got pregnant. And if you're older than 35, they do a battery of tests (laughs) to make, to make sure your decrepit old body can possibly (laughs) bring a life into the world. And one of them was a thyroid test and it was fine. And I told her that and she was like, get it rechecked. Now I am not the kind of person who like pushes for things very often. Actually I am now, but I was not then. Uh And so I kept calling my doctor's office and was like, listen, here's the deal. I have lost nearly half of my hair. And I also found out that my mom and her mom both had thyroid issues. So I told them that and they're like, okay, we'll retest your thyroid. And it was low. It wasn't crazy low, but it was just low enough. So they, they put me on medication, but my doctor was basically like, here's the thing though, this cycle of hair loss is just going to keep going. Like it's not going to stop just because you're on this medication. Like these follicles have already died or whatever. And so it's just going to keep coming out, which it did. So yeah, my, it just continued to fall out. And my husband kept being like, do you want me to shave your head? And another thing in hindsight, I would have done that immediately. Mm. Uh, Cause I just kept thinking like, oh, maybe these few strands, I can like piece them together and it'll be, and no one will know. And it was really heartbreaking because A, I had had such, I loved being pregnant and it had been going so well. I was like, oh, I'm so good at being pregnant. <laughs> and, and then to have this happen and to feel like I didn't want to go anywhere. I didn't want to see anyone. I was wearing like hats and scarves. I even got a wig at one point that I wore like twice. It just felt so sad. I was just so sad all the time. And to make it worse, um, my daughter was ended up being two weeks late. Like we went to the the doctor's appointment like after 37 weeks when it's sort mm-hmm. of like you're considered being to term. And every time it was like, she's not, you know, dropping at all, not dilated at all, nothing. It, wow. And we went to the exam on my due date. And he was like, there is no sign of Ugh. making any kind of progress. And I was so upset because one of the things my doctor had said, had offered is that once I had the baby, he thought my hair would grow back. And at that point I was like, sure you do. Sure. Right. Yeah. And and he ended up being right, but I, you know, I just wanted to have this baby. Like I just was done. And so after that appointment that was on my due date of September 12th, we went home and I was like, all right, Joe, shave it off. So he shaved, I mean, it took like four seconds. He shaved (laughs) my last little wisps of hair, Uh which felt great. I'm you sure know. it was liberating. It was. It was. And I wish I had done it sooner. And then sure enough, she, you know, once it's your due date, you're going to the doctor like every other day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and there was nothing. There was nothing happening. So 11 days past my due date, the doctor said basically like, you know, I can induce you, but because there is no progress at all, there's a very good chance you will end up with an emergency C-section mm. or we can just schedule a C-section. Mm-hmm. Now I had been very like, I don't want a C-section. I will deliver this vaginally and you know, mm-hmm. whatever. And so hearing that was like, I just like burst into tears and, and mm-hmm. was like, this isn't how I planned this going. And um, after a big chunk of you having things not going as planned, like yes. that's just a thing on top of that. Yes. And I, I really had this vision, like Joe and I had been working on, you know, the, the labor playlist for so long. And, you know, I just had everything all like planned for how it was going to be. And I think I might have waited a couple more days, or I Mm -hmm. think I might have tried the induction, except for the fact that when Joe's first daughter was born, his wife at the time was induced and had Mm -hmm. to have an emergency C-section. And so he was feeling a lot of like PTSD from that Mm -hmm. experience because it was like alarms going off, her being wheeled into an ER type of thing. And so a combination of factors, I was like, let's just schedule this Mm C-section. I think sometimes when I talk about that, there is a judgment uh, to Mm -hmm. C-sections and there is especially a judgment to like non-emergency C-sections, like scheduled Mm. C-sections. Because this wasn't the type of thing 
where I am like six months out was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to have a C-section, you know, right. which some people right. do. It was not what I wanted to do, but it felt like the right choice. Yeah. It especially felt like the right choice because she was 10 pounds, three ounces. Oh my God. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so anyway, we, we scheduled it for the next morning to have a C-section and I don't regret it. And my hair grew back. My hair started growing back within like days. That's this amazing. like, this like stubble came up. So she was born September 24th. And I think in November, so like two months later, I made sort of my first uh, public appearance with feeling like my hair had grown back enough to mm-hmm. be able to do that. Yeah, it was absolutely crazy. I had never, ever found anyone who had a similar experience. You know, you can Google anything yes. and someone has come up with something. And I couldn't find any thing about it. And I think that was particularly terrifying. And it took me over a year to feel like I was in the right mental space to write that article that I did about Mm -hmm. it. But I did it mainly so that if other people were going through this, something would come up in their Google search. And I've had, I think, six people at this point reach out to me because they've had it, the same thing happening and have read the article. And there's no answers really necessarily, but I think it just makes people feel better to know yes. that it's out there in the world and that someone else has gone through it. I am not this like one person this thing is happening to. Mm-hmm. Pregnancy is so scary. It, it is, is so scary because <laughs> it feels like there's so many things that can go wrong. Mm-hmm. And those are the things you know about. And so when right. th- something goes wrong and you're like, wait, what? And even the doctors are like, huh, that's weird. It's just, <laughs> the, you never want to hear a doctor be like, I don't know. No, no. It was quite an experience and I feel very fortunate that that my hair did grow back and everything and that I had I had a good support system. I should have had more of a support system. That was the other regret is that I just mm. didn't tell many people and I hid at home because I was so mortified by it. The version of me now would not have done that. But at the time I felt embarrassed. I was like, why is this happening? Yeah. I didn't want people to feel sorry for me. Like it right. felt weird, but you don't um, have to manage their feelings on top of the experience that you're going through. Exactly. Yeah. It it is so interesting because there are things that come up in pregnancy. I think with all of the unknowns that you're facing where you're like, even if you do have a community, the feelings of like, do I want to reach out? Do how much do I want to tell? How do I best utilize my community? And how do I feel okay with what's going on with all of these unknowns around me? Absolutely. It is a tricky path to navigate. And I think, you know, there's so much information available to us. Yeah. And there's also just a lot of judgment. And not all of that judgment is intentional judgment. But I think there's a a lot of times we're like, well, this is how I did it. So this is how you should do it. Right. And so I think all of that stuff gets scary, like reaching out to people or whatever. You know, it's really tough. And in the end, you know, you end up with a baby. Right. <laughs> and, and it's all okay. However, yeah. it comes out and whatever you had to do to get there, every path is different. And I think it's just so interesting. We're in a time where we are sharing so much more information, but then we have to sort of deal with the consequences of that, whether we get feedback from other people about our choices or just how we feel about it compared right. to other people. And yeah. it's tough you know, while it was so valuable to have my friends who had been through this before, Mm -hmm. I found a couple of things. It's like, all we can do is compare someone else's experience to our own. I would get a lot of like, well, this is what I went through or whatever. Uh, But another funny thing that happens that I got so frustrated by, I think more so right after Valerie was born and I had questions about like breastfeeding and things Mm -hmm. like that. And all of my friends would be like, you know, I don't remember. And I'm like, how can you not remember? <laughs> it was two yeah. years ago. And now yeah. like, I totally get how you can't remember. <laughs> like, I can't remember anything. But I remember being so frustrated. Like, but all these people who can help me and they, yeah. they, they can't remember where they were at this point or anything like I that. I need this precious information. Yes. And it's, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, it's nuts. It can really make you crazy, all the research and, you know, you're this week and you're, this is what's going on. And this is the thing that could happen. That's terrible. And it's like, I don't just let me get through this. (laughs) There's so many unknowns on top of this, like ginormous unknown that you are embarking, creating. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Yes. It's It's true. uh, Yeah. It's tough for, uh, people who have been either perfectionist or control freaks at (laughs) certain times of their lives. Yeah. You cannot micromanage your pregnancy. No, no. 
and, and, and in a way, like, you know, I look back on what happened to me. I, I don't want to say fondness. Like there's some things I would do differently. Mm-hmm. It was a great introduction to parenthood. Mm. I'm just like, guess what you are not going to see coming. <laughs> right. Right. And you have to deal with it. And yeah. it was also the first time that I was absolutely sure that I would sacrifice anything for mm. my child. Because what I said to my doctor when he was like, you know, oh, this is a weird thing. I was like, listen, I don't care about my hair fall. I mean, I do care about my hair falling out, but please just tell me, is this indicating anything that could be dangerous to the baby? Yes. And when he assured me that it wasn't, I was like, okay, then we'll roll with this. We'll deal with it. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, I was like, oh, am I going to resent her? You know? And it's like, no, not not in the slightest, you know, to me, it's now, it's like, I have a cool war story. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And, and it, it became sort of a comfort to know, like, I will do it. I will put it all on the line. Yeah. I will, you know, happily deal with those sacrifices for the health and well being of my daughter. And that sort of launched it all. It was a remarkable experience. Very memorable. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Is there anything else either with that topic or in general about pregnancy or motherhood that you feel is particularly under talked about? You know, I don't know. I I think even in the six years, almost seven years Mm -hmm. since I gave birth, I feel like there has been so much wonderful progress made in this area, just in terms of people being more open to discuss things. Mm -hmm. I think with breastfeeding, like I was very self-conscious about it. And I feel like within two years, it became this big push where it's like, everyone breastfeed everywhere. Just, Mm -hmm. just do it. Let's normalize this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so wonderful. I think people are being more open talking about fertility struggles and miscarriages and Mm -hmm. things like that. So I really think we've come very far in a, in a short amount of time. And I think it's fantastic as always, I think the main thing is like, we just have to follow our own journey and do what's best for us and not compare it to what other people are going through or dealing with. Like I know before I had judgment towards C-sections, not in all cases, Mm -hmm. but when I had friends who were like, you know, for this reason or this reason, I'm, I'm having a Mm C-section, um, you know, always being like, but did you really try hard enough to not have a C-section or whatever? And now I'm like, it's so ridiculous. I have a friend, a guy friend who his wife had a baby like a couple of weeks before mine. So we Mm -hmm. were sort of talking back and forth and his wife, of course, natural childbirth and didn't have any drugs. And he Mm -hmm. was, you know, championing her and, and, you know, whatever. I was like, good, good, good. Mm -hmm. And he, at some point referred to C-sections as like not really giving birth. Oh, whoa. And I was like, and then, no, 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 no. Yeah. (laughs) And I, you know, became an advocate for that of like, listen, it's major surgery. No yes. one, no one is like, this will be so fun and easy no. to have like a major incision healing while you are now having a new baby. Like yeah. in any other circumstances, if you had surgery like that, you'd have bed rest for a week, but instead it's like, you're never getting into bed. <laughs> yeah. You're um, up forever yes. and you have this major thing that's happened. Yeah. You. And, and you're carrying around 10 pounds all the time. So yeah. I just think it really changed my perspective on a lot of that and made me truly feel like whatever someone's journey is, it's theirs and and whoever is helping them, but it's not, it's none of my business. I think we're making really great strides towards that in general, which is wonderful. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you're still a mother. Yeah. Cause I assume, you know, you read so much stuff about like, well, C-section babies often don't breastfeed as well and da 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 and you know, all this. And none of that ended up being true in, mm-hmm. in my case, but it is, you, you even like put the judgment on yourself just because I think when you picture having a baby, you, yeah. that's how you picture it. And, and, totally. you know, but at the end of the day, you got your baby and here you are, you did it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, Thank you so much for doing this. You bet. Thanks Uh, for having me. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I was so happy I got to talk to you. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Week by Week. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. And follow me on Instagram at Week by Week Podcast. Check out the show notes for additional resources I used or referenced during this episode. 
This podcast was produced during the COVID-19 pandemic and recorded remotely. Our show today was produced by me, Celeste Busa, and Dave Hill, and edited by Douglas Sarine and Colleen Beasley. Week by Week is a Gumption Pictures production.